Hello, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are on this beautiful planet of ours. Welcome to Sustainability in Your Ear. This is the podcast conversation about accelerating the transition to a sustainable carbon neutral society, and I'm your host, Mitch Ratcliffe. Thanks for joining in this important conversation today. IKEA is a global retail and furniture giant that has grown up with the modern era, defining a spare but elegant Nordic style that influences many of our homes. While I can't always pronounce the names of IKEA products, they've played a part in my kids' bedrooms and our offices for decades. Now, IKEA is working to contribute to a more sustainable lifestyle. They've been a leader in this area for a while. The company has committed to use recycled materials in all of its products, as well as make them reusable and refurbishable by 2030. Now, that's a tall order for a company that sees $50 billion in revenue and operates almost 500 stores in 62 countries. Our guest today is Marty Dietz, IKEA's country sustainability manager in the United States. She's based in Philadelphia. And Marty leads the IKEA team that is creating and implementing IKEA's climate goals, which include designing all products for a circular lifestyle, using renewable and recyclable materials and products, developing new circular services and business models that support them, and collaborating with other organizations to lead to a sustainable economy by example. Now, there's a lot to Utforska, that's Swedish for explore, at IKEA, so let's dive into the conversation. You can learn more about IKEA at IKEA.com, and we'll talk with Marty Dietz after this quick commercial break. Welcome to the show, Marty. How are you doing today? I'm well, Mitch. How are you? Doing very well. Thank you for joining us on the show today. I, I, you know, look, I, IKEA is a vast company. Uh, what does a country sustainability manager do, and how do you do it to make what you you deliver to the customer locally relevant, but also fit into the sustainability program of, of a global corporation? Great question. And thank you for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to, to talk with you. Um, so as a country sustainability manager, um, I'm tasked with uh, working with all of our units to make sure that we meet our country goals. Our country goals roll up into our global goals. So every country uh, in IKEA is responsible for participating in carbon reductions and um, zero emissions and EV charging, et cetera, et cetera. And making it locally relevant is, in the U.S., um, a bigger challenge than it may be for some other European countries. Uh, so in the U.S., we have to think about who is the customer in California, who yeah. is the customer in New York. So I get to work closely with the uh, market managers and the uh, area managers to understand their customer needs and the store needs um, and what is available to them, uh, mm -hmm. because you're going to have different policies in New York than you do in California. So um, some incentives are better in other places. So how do we maximize what we can do while keeping the message that we have relevant for the customer in that area? Well, you know, I mean, in not just different policies, but different geographies and in mm -hmm. a very distinct sense. I mean, and Ikea That's can right. serve millions of people in one location in the Northeast, but it might take two or three to reach the same number of people in the West. How do you, how do you, for instance, when you think about providing EV charging uh, mm -hmm. and so forth, factor those kinds of differences into the decisions you make? So EV charging is a, a little bit easier because mm -hmm. it's more widely available. Um, so that's a decision like that could, is going to be based on um, uh, how many customers go to the store and what what does the market tell us? How many EVs are there in that area? Mm -hmm. So that helps us make those kind of determinations and in infrastructure. But if we're talking about something like water scarcity, yeah. um, then we're going to have a different message for the customers in Utah than we will in Pennsylvania. Um, and we will highlight that there are water efficient fixtures for sale at Ikea that can help them in their home. Uh, whereas in Pennsylvania, we might talk more about the EV infrastructure or about um water collection because we have so much of it <laughs> so so you're thinking about sustainability extends from operations all the way to marketing it sounds like absolutely absolutely because the um there's a message to tell and we we can talk about the things that we're doing um as long as we have the data to support it we substantiate mm -hmm. our claims mm -hmm. uh but we do it's a part of the story and about how the product that you purchase from ikea can help you at home as well to be more sustainable or um to use less in your home. 
So one of the questions that I that always comes up is whether or not sustainability is good for IKEA's business first. I mean, can you talk about, I, I know this came from the top, but how has it changed the performance of the company financially? So it's an interesting question for IKEA. And um, it's interesting because sustainability is one of the um, design elements when they're thinking about a product. So mm -hmm. in Sweden, the designer is thinking, I want to make this product. How do I do it? So one of the tenets they're using is sustainability. What is the product going to be made of? What is the end of its life look like? Uh, how do I think about the circular economy with this with this product? So it it is part of the value of the product that we have. So it makes it very easy to, um, to, to have it as part of running business because it's part of the everyday that we do at IKEA. Does that mean it's good for business? Uh, yeah. If the short answer to that would be yes, um, only because it's part of running business. So mm -hmm. it's not it's not an add-on. It's not separate. Um, it's part of doing business. So uh, that integrated approach, though, is yes. really critical. And did, did you yes. find that getting to an integrated view of sustainability was critical to it becoming a financially beneficial decision? That is a question that has uh, multiple strings to it. So if I think about it from a product design, no, it, it, it's there's no discussion about the finances uh, because sure. we're thinking about the cost first when we build it, when we right. build the product. But if I turn and look at the operations of the building and think about what are we going to put on the building to make it more efficient, that's where the tug of war happens with financials. Okay, so th you may say, gee, you know, we could change the way we cool the building. Mm -hmm. They look at the initial capital cost, mm -hmm. and you look at the long-term OPEX. Exactly. Okay, so it, exactly. Do you find that's a an easier conversation to have the deeper you go into the sustainability era? No. Good. <laughs> it's always a hard conversation. You always have to have a business case, and the yeah. and the business case has to have an ROI. Um, and it has to be within a certain time frame. So the the conversation doesn't get easier just because sustainability is integrated into the business. Now you have a IKEA's approach to design is 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 democratic design. You you, you capital right. those words. How do you integrate? And you've mentioned it several times. The circular economy into your thinking about a democratic design is that not just the product and the and the the benefits to the consumer, but the full life cycle and thinking about how to make it easy for the consumer to bring it back and reuse it. That's exactly right, Mitch. Um, we, in addition to product longevity, uh, we have a buyback resale program that uh, we take back your product, your IKEA product when you're mm -hmm. done with it's with, with loving it. So bring it back, we'll buy it back from you. And we, if we, uh, we will put it in our as is to give it a second life. Um, if we cannot sell it there, then we'll donate it. And the last thing that we possibly think of would be um, the recycling aspect. So, um, so if, if for instance, something isn't reusable or resellable, when you say recycling, what does that mean? And do you have, have you, have you begun to integrate uh, partners to d mm -hmm. handle different kinds of materials, for instance, because that's really the trick to making these things recyclable absolutely um and we have started yes uh some in some municipalities it's easier to do than others as i'm sure you can appreciate and some materials are a lot harder than others um so we're constantly looking for partners in this sphere to to take our product or to work with them to create the infrastructure so um yes that is a, a big challenge of the circular economy still do you have a sense at this point of how what percentage of what you do buy back ends up being resold versus being recycled or donated? We do have those statistics, and I just don't have them with me right now. But it is something that we track, and we do um, we do promote it internally to raise awareness about how well the program does. Tell us about the buyback and resell program. How does it work? And, and if I'm an IKEA customer, can I just anything go back, or, or are there limits? Okay, this is exciting. This is where it gets good. Uh, so first, you need to be an IKEA family member, which is free to do. You sign up, become a family member, um, which also awards you some discounts in store. So it's a great program to be a part of anyway. Um, and then we do have uh, product ranges or, or specific products that we do take back. There are over uh, 3,500 of those products that we'll take back. So it's likely that we'll take it. Um, but there are some um, 
rules and re- uh, legislation around what can't be bought back. Uh, okay. For instance, uh, children's uh, the children's uh, range. Uh, mm-hmm. A lot of that can't be taken back because children. Um, so assuming that your bookcase can mm-hmm. come back to us, it comes back to the store um, and then we tell you how much we're going to buy it back from you. We give you a store credit for that amount um, and then you are free to go. We take that product back. Uh, if it needs some touch up, some love, we'll give it to that and then put it on our as is uh, section at the same price that we bought it back from. So it's the same price we bought it. We're going to sell it for that same price. Interesting. Where's the financial benefit in that? And I'll preface that question by saying, I know that in other circumstances that we've talked with uh, companies about, it's just getting the customer to come back using that credit that ends up making this a valuable marketing investment. That's exactly right, Mitch. You nailed it. So you've got that credit now. We're sure that you're going to go back into the store, perhaps buy a hot dog and maybe a chair. The circular economy is a flywheel, it sounds like. Yeah, that's uh, that's probably a good way to think about it. Yeah. So how do you how did you kickstart that? Uh, and, and can you talk a little about again back to the conversation with the finance team? What did it take to get them to see the benefit of the long term investment in giving people credit for the stuff they had purchased from IKEA in the past? Um, so that was a different conversation, uh, in in part because this was uh, a task that came from the top down. So each country was told we're gonna we're going to have a buyback program, figure out how to set it up. So Make it, was a it much, okay. Yep, exactly. So it was a much different conversation than trying to put in renewable heating and cooling. <laughs> the finance couldn't object, sounds like. That's right. Yep. We just had to find a way to do it. Yep. As you look at your, your goal of making everything recycled or renewable, uh, using the materials that are recycled or renewable by 2030, tell us about the progress you're making and what have you found it's easier to do? Mm. The easier part is the buyback, is uh, getting the product back and putting it in as is and mm-hmm. give it, continuing its life. Uh, that's that's the easy part. So what are some of the harder parts of making circularity work as you look across the IKEA product catalog? Um, the infrastructure available for recycling. Uh, that's the largest challenge. Internal to IKEA or the local partners that we were talking about before the local partners Mm -hmm. so if we if we want to think about um mattress recycling or textile Mm -hmm. recycling it's uh those partners are few and far between so it makes it hard to find alternatives for those products well as we know from our database at earth 911 there's not a lot of mattress recycling going on but there's a lot of valuable material as well as a lot of material just simply ending up in landfills has ikea either talked with local policymakers or gone to industry associations and said, let's work together? Yes, mm-hmm. constantly. Um, and in the in Europe, uh, our investment arm has uh, propped up a mattress recycler. So mm-hmm. there is opportunity, there is discussion, at least internally, like how do we, how do we get that type of infrastructure here in right. the U.S. for IKEA to be able to do that? Um, but we're constantly trying to talk to policymakers um, to figure out there is that raw material, there's that material in the mattresses. How do we, how do we get to it? How do we yeah. use it? How do we give it a second life? So based on the, the, the broad policy diversity and geographic diversity of the country, is part of the problem that we're 50 different small states trying to figure <laughs> this out separately? And, and how would you recommend, I mean, just based on the conversations you've had, how would you recast the way we think about recycling in the states? Uh, yes, we are definitely 50 states. And then even within the state, smaller municipalities mm-hmm. talking about this and doing this yeah, completely different. So it, it gets very bespoke in some areas. Yeah. Um, and play, I, I think it's as simple as creating a common language that we can all talk about circularity. Um, rather than having to change the dialogue every time we go to a different municipality or a different state. Um, so standardizing language, first and foremost, would be a great start. Well, you know, you all have partnered with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation on exactly that, and we had a <laughs> show talking about it. So let's take a quick commercial break, and we'll come back and talk about that. We'll be right back, folks. 
Now let's get back to the discussion with Marty Dietz. She's a U.S. country sustainability manager at, at, at IKEA. She's based in Philadelphia. So Marty, as you were talking about just before we went to commercial break, uh, you've worked with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation to create a circular vocabulary. And we had them on the show when they introduced us to talk about it. How does IKEA communicate and educate customers about that language? How do you build in circularity into the way even that you market? That's a great question because it's 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 fun. Um, it's through a little bit of education. It's through a little bit of engagement. It's through um, it's through our marketing and how we talk about it in our marketing. Um, so it's a little bit of everything to create almost a, a landscape, an atmosphere, a, 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 an attitude about what what the language is, and then being consistent with us using it as well. In terms of thinking about that language and the execution of the idea of circularity, a lot of folks tend to think that either the consumer is responsible or the business is responsible. Is it a is it a partnership? And how does how does IKEA try to bring your customers into that engagement with circularity? I love this question um, because part of our mission is to engage the customer to have a health, a more healthy and sustainable life. So mm -hmm. um, we'll meet the customer where they are, but we'd love for them to come on the whole journey with us. Um, so we do explain where our materials come from. Um, we do try and offer services in store for the consumer to understand what next life would be for the product. Uh, we take back batteries. We take back um, LED light bulbs. We take back um and a, a variety of materials in store so that mm -hmm. consumers have something to do with it. And we take that moment to educate them on what it is that they're doing and where it's going. Um, so I think it's, it's a little, it, it's a, it's a partnership in that we need to be, Ikea needs to be a steward of, of bringing the customer with us on the journey. Now, one of the ways you're doing that is helping people maintain and repair their uh, their IKEA furniture. Tell us about the the free small parts program and, and oh yeah yeah that's a a great program, um and it's just that it's a free free spare parts program. So if you are missing a piece or a piece breaks, um, you can go online and order the piece that you need, and we'll ship it to you. Or conversely, you can go to the store and pick it up there. Um, it's just that easy. Now, making stuff last longer, how does that benefit IKEA in terms of the customer relationship? What do you find uh, the impact is? Because there you're not giving them a credit that brings them back in the store, but you are creating a deeper relationship. Yeah, it is. And it's part of the, if if done properly, I'll say this, um, The it shows the responsibility that IKEA is taking for its furniture, that, mm -hmm. um, you know, that we understand things break, life happens, and you still love that piece and you want to keep that piece. How do we support you in continuing to, to love your piece. Uh, so there's there's that responsibility that we have as furniture makers. I'm curious, have you thought about having your customers who do love the stuff they buy from Ikea and take care of it for a long time, tell those stories through the site? Mm -hmm. is, is that potentially a way that Ikea could catalyze this conversation in a broader way? And I think so, Mitch, because we do have loyal customers and we do have... Um, local market relevance uh, mm -hmm. with those customers. So I think that that could be a really good way to, um, to have people share their love of the furniture and how they take care of it. You know, I remember when Ikea came to Renton, Washington, which mm -hmm. was in yeah. the and it became a destination, you know, like you went to see this massive facility because it, you would drive in one end and the other end, people came out with a lot of stuff. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's a, it's an hour long adventure just to go into the store for the first time yeah how do you how do you imagine the ikea facility changing its relationship with the community so that it becomes a hub mm -hmm. for recycle not just recycling but circularity generally i think it's capitalizing on just on on that visitation we know that mm -hmm. you're going to come to the store so how do we maximize that trip that you're about to make that could take you several hours to get to so making sure there's awareness of all the services that we do have available in the stores so that you're prepared when you get there to to do all of the things to bring back your your gently loved items to get to have some lunch to fortify you for your journey through the store to pick out and see and get inspired by the things that you see there well so do you do you think in terms of enabling somebody to plan that trip should they be thinking about repair 
and reuse? I mean, should they bring stuff back? How do you, are you building an app that helps people plan and think about those kinds of things? That, that sounds like a, a remarkable opportunity to deepen the customer engagement that we were talking about before, but also a very practical way for you to change the the material flow through the store. Yeah. And we, we do, we do try to leverage our apps and the website to make sure that consumers can find things easier. Um, but recognizing that there is like with any digital interaction, there's always a challenge to navigate and figure out because every, everybody thinks differently. Sure. Um, so we do have local pages, local web pages that shows here's what your store has to offer. Uh, so we do try to highlight all of the services that are available so that if if you check out the website before you get there, you should have a very keen sense of what's available. Have you thought about to the question of, of the diversity of policy and just the challenges of the, the local recycling and reuse infrastructure generally, how IKEA could enlist the customer's participation in getting the policies that you need to make mm. this system more broadly available and easier to use. I, I, can IKEA play a, a, a lobbying role for some in so many words? Um, IKEA could, um, but at the end of the day, we are um, we're furniture sellers, uh -huh. right? so we can influence and we can educate, but we're not lobbyists. I, perfectly fair. <laughs> as But as, as we talk about the way that the economy is evolving, obviously business is at the forefront. Mm -hmm. Where do you see IKEA's uh, leadership being exerted within industry? I mean, mm -hmm. for instance, I know you're driving a lot of the deforestation uh, work in, in Europe. Mm -hmm. How can we, how can, how, how, how can a major retailer like Ikea help the United States rethink mm -hmm. the way that everything flows through our economy? And, and I know that's a yeah. abstract question. But, but it's a very real question um, because there are activities going on around that. So mm -hmm. we are part, we are, we do join groups that do have policy um, or, or lobbyists. So part like RELA or NRF um, mm -hmm. uh, retail group organizations we can join them and then they act on our behalf so as a member we then have access to that type of engagement yeah well the national retail federation is a great example of that mm -hmm. and it's an organization that is now just beginning to think about the role that the retail location has in in the the, the reverse logistics networks um as you think about the 2030 vision everything made of renewable materials or recycled materials and recyclable materials how do you see the economy changing? Are, are there going to be new components, local components that are participating, that are keeping the material locally in use? I think about this a lot, Mitch, um, because once we do get that secondary raw material, then what? So, mm -hmm. and, and, and it's a when, because I'm very optimistic that this will happen. So then we've got all of this material that can have a second life and it's, it is local because it's going to be local infrastructure that collects it. Um, mm -hmm. So now there's, a, I think that opens up opportunity for the entrepreneur and for the creative mind to, to think about, oh, I've got access to this now. I didn't have it before. What can I do with it now? So I, I think that, and this is me, Marty Dietz, I think mm -hmm. that um, we're going to see things that we've never seen before. So yeah. almost like a, another type of revolution that happens in a material content. Well, you mentioned mattresses. What what do you think that the the low hanging fruit is for those entrepreneurs who are thinking about materials in their community that they could get involved in in keeping in use? I, the, the first and foremost, what I would think of is wood. Um, okay. IKEA has a lot of wood. There's wood in some mattresses, um, mm -hmm. and so it's a very accessible material, um, mm -hmm. and it has tons of longevity as well as being a carbon sink so why not use it i'm surprised you didn't say metal no yeah, i didn't no nope. yeah is it too easy i mean is it so easy that that's already yes. taken care of <laughs> yeah, taken care of that's a that's a strong that's a strong phrase but okay. um it is a more desirable and more thought of product mm -hmm. one of the materials that's challenging is glass what's your take on mm. Glass as a, as a material that 
could be reused because right now a lot of the glass that's collected is being ground and used as daily cover in landfills, strangely. Mm -hmm. Glass is an interesting one because I've seen some really creative solutions on what to do with it. Um, and one of our stores uh, in Utah, Draper, has created mm -hmm. a uh, a community glass collection site in their parking really? lot, which is, um, while it's not, it, 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 they're just collecting it, they're not, and then recycling it in some capacity, but um, but it it's a way to engage the community and educate the community around that particular material. Um that said, there there are the creative solutions that can come with glass as well, mm -hmm. because it can be used in art. It ha it can be um, melted down. You know, there's there's other ways to think about glass that I'm hopeful that as this secondary raw material market gets going, more of that will come into play. That's really, I mean, the, I, I wasn't aware of the Draper uh, glass collection program. Mm -hmm. We'll have to add that to the database, but the. Um, how do, how does the, that kind of thing come around? It, 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 is that a, an opportunity for somebody to contact IKEA and say, we'd like to start to do this? And how would they do that? So that one was, um, that particular project was an IKEA-led project. Um, mm -hmm. And they worked with their local municipality to get it set up and get all the partners involved. Um, and then IKEA um, Draper promoted it to the community there. But um, yeah, if a customer came to the store with an idea, mm -hmm. We'd of course listen to it. Absolutely. Um, yeah, it's a it's a two way conversation. We love great ideas. IKEA is doing a lot of interesting things, and and Marty, I want to thank you for spending time to talk with us today. Can you uh, just tell us how people can follow along with IKEA's progress and and get involved if they want to? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, first and foremost, of course, our website. Um, all of the information we have a, a link for sustainability there, where you can find our reports and um, check on all the good stuff that we're working on, um, and then to get involved. Go to your local store. Ask the manager. Ask the manager. Ask okay. the Yeah, just that easy. Well, Marty, thanks very much for your time today. Oh, Mitch, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Really appreciate the time. That was my conversation with Marty Dietz, U.S. Country Sustainability Manager at IKEA, which is a true leader in retail circularity and reuse. You can learn more about IKEA, uh, and particularly IKEA U.S., at ikea.com slash U.S. The business benefits of embracing renewable, reusable, and recyclable products for some reason seem to remain a mystery for many companies, but IKEA's embrace of circular principles has delivered a clear return on investment. They see more customers return to the stores and online. Customers engage with IKEA throughout the life cycle of products that they buy, so it's easy to keep in touch with them and, and again, to market to them effectively. And those customers earn store credit for participating in circular practices, like returning a used bookshelf for resale. And those credits, again, keep people coming back. The circular economy isn't just about the materials flowing through the system, but about keeping everybody engaged in the system, thinking about the materials that they buy and use, and where they will ultimately end up after the, that useful life has ended. I'd not realized that IKEA didn't mark up refurbished items, which is a testament to the power of trade-in programs. Just keeping customers coming back can be sufficiently profitable. As we've learned in other interviews, take back and recycling programs can drive revenue while reducing a company's environmental impact. But we also heard again about the local challenges created by our divergent, often anachronistic recycling infrastructure. The United States needs to think systemically about building the circular economy, which, as Marty said, creates myriad entrepreneurial opportunities. IKEA's massive, multifaceted stores may be a model for spurring local innovation simply through their ability to connect flows of material to collection programs and processors that will keep wood, metal, glass, and more in use over many generations of products. So keep an eye on IKEA, folks. It's an interesting story. I hope you take a moment to share this podcast or any of the more than 470 interviews we produced on sustainability in your ear with your friends, your family, your coworkers. Folks, taking a moment to write a review on your favorite podcast platform will help your neighbors find us. So remember, you're the amplifiers that can spread more ideas to create less waste. Please tell folks that they can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Audible, or any of the fine purveyors of podcast goodness that they prefer. Thank you for your support.
I'm Mitch Ratcliffe. This is Earth 911's Sustainability in Your Ear, and we will be back with another innovator interview soon. In the meantime, take care of yourself, take care of one another, and let's all take care of this beautiful planet of ours. Have a green day. Thank you.